Number 49, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, in the series The Picture of God in All 66 by Graham Maxwell, recorded April 1984. This time, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Early fall, we'll do Matthew, but if perhaps some should join us at that time, I think we should spend the first session in the fall considering what happened between Malachi and the New Testament, the 400 years in there. And I'll, I'll bring things along to show you might not have had time to look at through the years. The documents that were written during that period. There aren't that many, the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha, and uh, other writings, of course, the writings of Josephus reflect on that period somewhat. And it gives us a clear understanding, I think, as to why Jesus was not appreciated when he came. He was not the one they were looking for. Though they were busily keeping Sabbath and paying tithe and practicing health reform, they were looking for a different kind of a Messiah. But now this time, these three books, Haggai, is mentioned elsewhere only in Ezra, and we should look at that in a moment. You remember when we did Ezra and Nehemiah, he was mentioned. He prophesied after the return from Babylon when the people were discouraged and they stopped building the temple. Two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, worked together and the job was done. Zechariah, naturally a contemporary of Haggai, the date is about 520 B.C., the 70 years are up and the people have come home. Malachi, assumed to be the last of the prophets, maybe about 425 BC, not much over 400 years before Christ was born. He may have overlapped Nehemiah a little bit, maybe just a little later. So let's start with Haggai. Mention of him in Ezra 5, 1 and 6, 14. Take a look at that. 5.1. Now the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So Ezra acknowledges their presence. And then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, he was their leader, and Jeshua, the son of Josedach, arose and began to rebuild the house of God which is in Jerusalem. And with them were the prophets of God helping them, those four. Then look at 6.14. 6.14. And the elders of the Jews built and prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo. They finished their building by command of the God of Israel and by decree of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And the house was finished. Isn't it interesting that they finished the house by command of God and those three uh, leaders? <laughs> interesting they should be associated. By decree of God and Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes. Now, right at the beginning are very familiar words. And I think I mentioned last time that churches where building programs are being instituted often hear their pastors use this paragraph. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel. Remember, he's the, the leader. They came out with him right at the beginning, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. You remember in Zechariah coming up, Joshua the high priest is the one who stands before God and Satan is accusing. That's the same one. Thus says the Lord of hosts, this people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider how you have fared. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put them into a bag with holes. Because many people feel that way. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider how you have fared. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house, that I may take pleasure in it, and that I may appear in my glory, says the Lord. You have looked for much, and lo, it came to little. 
And when you brought the little home even, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while you busy yourselves each with his own house. Therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought upon the land and the hills, upon the grain, the new wine, the oil, upon what the ground brings forth, upon men and cattle, and upon all their labors. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared before the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord. Note, messenger, isn't that Ellen White's favorite title? Messenger, see, it's, it's in there. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, says the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month. Now you can see why a, a pastor who has the gift for building churches would find that an irresistible passage to read. Haven't you, haven't you heard it? I've, I've heard that more than once. Uh, that's a rather good argument, isn't it? Now, going back to Ezra, I should have suggested you keep a finger in there. Look at Ezra 3.12 as to the reaction of the people as the building began to go up. Ezra 3.12. Maybe we should start with 10. Ezra 3.10 When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord, according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout, when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, Solomon's tremendous temple, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. Though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard afar. But then one needs to compare that with Haggai 2, the first part. In the second year of Darius the king, in the seventh month, on the twenty-first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say... Who is left among you that saw this house in its former glory? Well, they, were, they were there, weren't they? Ezra says they were there. The older men, the heads of houses were there. How do you see it now, the one we're just building here? Is it not in your sight as nothing compared with Solomon's temple? Yet now take courage, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Take courage, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Take courage, all you people of the land, says the Lord. Work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the promise that I made, made you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit abides among you. I thought he didn't come till Pentecost. Haven't there been many references to the spirit? He's always been here. My spirit abides among you. Fear not, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once again in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the, and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with splendor, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The latter splendor of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. Now when uh, did that happen? What's the meaning of all of that? It never was as glorious a temple, was it, as Solomon's. 
In what way was it more glorious than the previous one? You, you, know, you remember God, though, even um, uh, recognized that the other one was ready by sending fire down to consume the, the offering, and the glory of the Lord filled the place. Was there any similar manifestation of the majesty and glory of God in this much more modest temple? In what way could it be more glorious? As you may know, Ellen White comments on this. In Great Controversy, page 24, she discusses this in her usual eloquent way. What, what would your opinion be? How could the, the later temple in any way be more glorious than the previous one, since God had revealed his presence and he had revealed it in power? In what way was it really more glorious, more moving, more impressive to have the Messiah walking so gently through the precincts of the temple later on than to have God reveal himself in power, majesty, and glory in, in, the, in Solomon's temple. Because that, that typifies the way God wanted the relationship yes. to be all along. God never wanted to come with fire and yes. pomp and majesty and anything that would be fearful to people. But the meek and lowly Jesus walking as a man and talking to people and healing their diseases, and loving them, and receiving their love in return. That's what God always wanted. He always mm -hmm. wanted to be able to walk and to talk with us as a friend. And the fire and the majesty is not really friendly. It's awesome, but it's not as friendly. What do the rest of you think about that? I mean, which stirs you more? The, the infinite power and majesty and glory of God, or the fact that the infinite one would rather talk softly? And we not be afraid, which is more impressive. Yes. All through the Old Testament, you've pointed out how God was saying something about himself. Yes. In the New Testament, when Christ came, it was not that he, he is not saying something about himself, but now he has his messengers that go forth. The gospel message is being spread by mankind not just to the Israelites, but to all the Gentiles, as he wished it to be in the beginning. Would that reflect, say, Hebrews, uh, in many and various ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, as if it was reaching a high point, and in the, in the later temple, the son appeared to do this, which is the clearest revelation the universe will ever see. But it was not a revelation of majesty and power, was it? When did Jesus ever show that? He could have. In fact, he was tempted to do it when he was being tormented at the end, but he wouldn't do it. And he died so gently. Some are worried by that and think that's weakness. Others of us, knowing who he is, realize it's not weakness. That's the most incredible good news um, that secures peace and trust for eternity, that the infinite one does not wish to govern his universe from a position of majesty and power. He doesn't want to do that. Like with Elijah, not the wind, the earthquake, and fire, but the still small voice. For three and a half years, God walked this earth and governed the way he will for eternity, gently. But most people don't respect that. That's why he said, blessed are the meek. For, you know, they're the ones who will inherit the kingdom. Meek people. But nobody uh, respected meekness. They confused meekness with weakness. And that's why, do you remember... A long time ago, we commented on Moses saying, I'm the meekest of all men. He wasn't bragging. That's admitting to something that other people didn't respect. He wasn't ashamed to be meek. And you know he wasn't weak. He was a powerful leader. But he also was very meek and gentle. By the way, one of the texts during the night that I was working on, trying to decide on the best translation, it fits in with this. The famous words, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, his heart reads in um, Goodspeed's 1923 translation. Come to me, God speaking now, the powerful one. Come to me, all you who toil and are burdened, and I will let you rest. Let my yoke be put upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble-minded. That's God speaking. God's humble-minded. And your hearts will find rest, for the yoke I offer you is a kindly one. And the load I ask you to bear is light. Ah, oh, that's the all-powerful one speaking, you see. So, uh, could you imagine any of his commandments being a threat to our freedom? 
Though he is infinite in power, he says, I'm humble-minded, I'm gentle, I'd rather speak softly. Of course, if you're not impressed with that, how can I allow you to be around? I mean, that's the way I'm going to govern my universe. To admit some people in, he'd have to thunder from Sinai every morning. He'd have to pin the Ten Commandments to every wall in the New Jerusalem. He's not going to do that. The law is an emergency measure, and the emergency will be over. Because now everyone is willing to listen. And even though he speaks softly and gently, uh, we revere that more than anything else. Do you know, uh, coming up in Zechariah, it's a temptation to dip into it now, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And um, I remember a period in my life when I took that to mean not by your might or by your power, but by my power was the meaning, and it's often used that way. No, this is God saying, look, not by my might or by my power, and I have an infinite amount of it, but by my spirit who works through love and truth will this be accomplished. And that's the same message, you see, that's coming through here. And that's why the most glorious thing the universe ever saw was the infinitely powerful one walking around so gently, not from weakness, but from incredible discipline and self-control and desire to reveal the ultimate truth about our God. The fact that he stood in the temple and taught there in his gentle way, that's the greatest thing that's ever been revealed to the universe. That's far more glorious than a display of power. And um, I wish we had men said more about that. We're not trying to compete with the most glorious picture in terms of power in the world. There are some churches put on quite a show of that, don't they? Even their leaders come on, you know, great pomp and circumstance. We should be noted for the still small voice approach. Well, we do have to get attention at times. That's true. It's very biblical. It's very godlike to know when to take people to Sinai. But to stay there all the time, you know, some folk always preach from the foot of Sinai. Well, if their audience is needed, that's all right. But my opinion is that after you've taken people to Sinai to get their attention, it would be well to move on and have some still small voice in due course of time. When Jesus came gently to the temple, he also made a whip of cords and drove out the money changers. Yeah, now we need to consider when we get to the Gospels what he did with the whip and how he looked. Um, the, who ran? Did everybody run? No, the children didn't run. And the sick didn't. And when the guilty ones came back, and they were sheepish that they had all run from this gentle person, they found him surrounded by the children and the sick, telling him stories and healing them. Uh, when I was a boy and a powerful man, and he was, he was a carpenter, you know, for 30 years, vigorous, healthy, and a big man got angry, I'd be inclined to be the first out of, <laughs> out of his reach, you know. The children saw no need to be afraid. So I think it was more the guilt uh, of the individuals. And there is this thing of divinity flashing through humanity. Um, I wonder what that looks like. Uh, they saw this. Love has such power that when you are uh, a rebel and you see this, it does something to you. Anyway, they ran, didn't they? But he, did, he didn't scourge them out of the temple. If he used his whip on anybody, it would be on the animals, I would suppose. There's no suggestion he used that on people. Well, we come to that in the Gospels. To raise the major question of all three books, let's pause here with Haggai and the rebuilding of the, of the sanctuary like this. Just a hundred years before, a century before, you remember... The books we read about the leaders of Israel up in the mountains sacrificing with the cult prostitutes and all the idols in Jerusalem and the people sacrificing to the queen of heaven and all those other things that were going on. And God let them go into the discipline of captivity. He didn't bring the ten tribes back. He brought these two back, though, from Babylon, though only a few came. The book of Esther describes what happened to those who stayed behind. They spent their 70 years in discipline. During that period, Daniel and Ezekiel wrote, and they knew the time was coming for the people to go home, and they hoped that the people would understand why they had been in the discipline of captivity. Remember Daniel's confession? And Ezekiel seems to suggest that maybe the people aren't any better. 
but that God is taking them home to say something about himself. So sure enough, the small group comes back to Palestine, and soon they're discouraged. The work on the temple and even on the city stops. And Haggai and Zechariah come, along with those two leaders, Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest, to urge them to get on with the building. And lo and behold, they get it built. But there's still more to be done, and it takes Ezra and Nehemiah, you remember, to finish the city walls. Meanwhile, they have intermarried with the heathen, adopted their customs. Do you remember half the children couldn't even speak the language of the Jews? And they were back where they were before. Two things are mentioned particularly, the idolatry that resulted from the intermarriage and the violation of the Sabbath, you recall. But under Ezra's ministry, the reading of the Bible to them, there was a great revival. They got the walls erected. And there's no record that they set up idols again. Jesus never commented on the Jews having idols, did he? And how about intermarrying with the heathen? In Jesus' day, why, when they came in from the marketplace, they washed their hands in a special way, lest they be contaminated by these heathen, let alone marrying them. If they touched things the Gentiles had touched, they felt contaminated. Now they went to the other extreme, and the ditch on either side of the road is just as deep. And uh, there developed the sects of the Pharisees, probably the ones most like us, a very honorable people, committed to God and the Scriptures and the Ten Commandments, the Sadducees, who had uh, more gifts in administration and real estate, and uh, uh, there are a lot of things they didn't believe. You remember Paul one day said, uh, I'm on trial here because of my views about the resurrection. And that pitted the Pharisees against the Sadducees and gave him a little rest while they had at each other over that issue, for they didn't agree. Then there were the Essenes, who were so very, very strict, and the Zealots, who wanted to... Uh, uh, start a war against the Romans. Much form, much legalism. You remember how pious they were. And yet in Desire of Ages, Ellen White speaks of the very stamp of demons being on the face of people in those days, and Christ came. And as John says, he came to his home, and his family rejected him. His family told him he had a devil, and finally tortured him to death to silence him. And we come to A.D. 34, and God turns to the whole world now, not working specially through the descendants of Abraham. And yet here is God just 500 years before saying, I want you to build a temple, get on with this thing, and I'll greatly bless you. Why do you think God bothered to send those leaders to urge the people to build a temple when in the precincts of that temple they would say that his son had a devil? to be so misrepresenting him. So uh, what really um, is God trying to accomplish? I thought maybe after we finish these three books, we should come back to that to sort of um, mark the end of our Old Testament discussion. I mean, what was God waiting for? And what might he be waiting for now? Is it something similar or something different? Ellen White has a comment in Prophets and Kings 704, that uh, if only they had risen to their opportunity, those Jews could have prepared the way, not for the second coming of Christ, which we see as our mission, but they could have prepared the way for the first coming of Christ. That's an interesting assignment, isn't it? Adventists of the first coming, and now we're Adventists of the second coming. I mean, wouldn't it have been a privilege to help prepare the people and then welcome Christ when he came? He didn't go to some part of the world that wouldn't know who he was. He came to that part of the world where his most devoted followers should be, those who loved all the key texts about the Messiah to come. And they followed all the ceremonies to show their faith in the one to come. And he came, and they didn't like what they saw, and they killed him. Well, why, why did God urge them to get on with this? Well, there was a remnant of good people all through there, wasn't there? They were God's main point of contact with the human race, just as in the days of the flood he was down to eight, and they weren't outstanding at that. And from this nucleus came the apostles, didn't they? And the early Christians, where would we be if there hadn't been that group? So there's always been a nucleus. We often call them the remnant, and it makes you wonder at the present time how many of us in this room are members of the nucleus. You know, there's a, there's a mixed multitude, and then there's the nucleus. 
do you privately feel you belong to this group that's at the very heart of the movement, you know? You know what's going on, and you're preparing for it. Uh, he's always had a few like that. Sometimes it seems very few, though one day Elijah said, God, I think you're down to one. At the flood you had eight, but you've just got one now, and that's me. And God says, don't be so depressed, Elijah. There are 7,000 others who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. So somebody asked Ellen White where God's chosen people were, you remember? And she replied, the greater number are yet in the other communions in her day, and I'm sure many of them are still there now. Look at Haggai 2.5 again. The reference to my spirit being among you. Um, can you recall how many places there is reference to the spirit being active in Old Testament time? That's a question often raised. Can you think of some just uh, quickly um, times when there's mention of the Holy Spirit doing the very kind of thing he's described as doing in the New Testament, like leading people to repentance? And um, Think of any places that pop into mind? Do you remember in the 51st Psalm, the Psalm of Repentance, take not thy Holy Spirit from me? He was leading David to repentance. How about my spirit shall not always strive with man? How about at creation? The Spirit of God was there during creation week. Uh, many references. Have you ever gone through to see how many? Then uh, why did Jesus say, it's better that I go away so the Spirit can come? He was there all along. Is it that they would be more open to his kind of leadership? If Jesus went and they realized now, we don't have him to lean on. We're going to have to take what we have. We've got the Old Testament. We've got the memory of what he did and said. And, uh, and the Spirit will help us remember, help us understand. In fact, who inspired the writing of the records? In fact, who inspired the Old Testament books before Pentecost? But the Holy Spirit says the holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's been active. Or were there only a few drops in the Old Testament? Well, that's a very picturesque thing, but uh, the Spirit is either here or he isn't. For the Holy Spirit is as much a person as God is a person. Um, that was Ellen White's very strong opinion. You remember, that was a statement in Avondale of consequence. She said to the student body there in chapel in Australia, we need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds, you remember. So you can't have a part of a person. He was active, but people were not listening to him as well as they did after Jesus came and explained, instructed the disciples. And then in the upper room, they really studied things through. They went through the Old Testament and they fitted in his life and his teachings and they were ready to be helped. Um, but he's always been here. What's your understanding of that? I was interested yes. in uh, the several people who uh, it says the Spirit was with him. As uh, yes. David was anointed, uh, it says that the Spirit came upon him yes. and never left him. But Saul, it says the Spirit came upon him, and he, the Spirit left him. For he can be resisted. And also well, um, Samson, yeah. it says the Spirit That's left right. him, and he perceived it not. Mm -hmm. So that uh, there must back. be a fine line somewhere. <laughs> yes. Well, that's, that's what we call the unpardonable sin. Um, there's a lesson coming up. We've already done it in my Sabbath school class because we're six weeks in advance. Um, um, God revealed through the Holy Spirit, uh, knowing God through the Holy Spirit. And there's a section in there on the unpardonable sin and the resistance of the Spirit. So that'll be coming up in Sabbath school shortly. Let's look at Zechariah, uh, who worked with Haggai. More messages of encouragement to these disheartened Jews. Many symbols used and eight visions, all of them explained, because uh, Zechariah would say, tell me, what does that mean? I wish all the prophets had done that. So everything could be explained. There are the horsemen, the four horns and the four carpenters, the man with the measuring line, Joshua, the high priest, and Satan. That's a great picture. We should at least discuss that one. The golden candlestick and the two olive trees, the flying roll, the ephah and the woman, the four chariots. And if you want an interesting discussion of those, look in the SDA Bible commentary on Zechariah. It's, it's well done. 
Mingled among these, these visions and these pictures are statements indicating God's concern for his people who came home. Now you know he was concerned for the ones who didn't come home. That's the book of Esther. He really looked after them, didn't he? Now the ones who came home, look at places like chapter 1, 12 and following. Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah? against which thou hast had indignation these 70 years. See where the 70 years are mentioned, several places, 70 years. And the Lord answered, gracious and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. So the angel who talked with me said to me, cry out, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion. In the predicament that they're in, they, you know, they haven't built the temple yet. And they hadn't built the walls, and they were all intermarried, and all these problems. And I am very angry with the nations that are at ease. For while I was angry but a little with my people, and so disciplined them, they furthered the disaster. They overdid it. They were too harsh. I like that sentence. You know, I was angry just a little, but they were angry over much. They, they went too far. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, I have returned to Jerusalem with compassion. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts, and the measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Cry again, thus says the Lord of hosts, my city shall again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. A little earlier, by the way, we shouldn't miss the appeal of the same chapter, verse 2, where the prophet says, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Be not like your fathers to whom the former prophets cried out, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or heed me, says the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? And so on. Now, there are a number of um, uh, familiar passages, like 2.8 in this book, where God says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, After his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. It's God talking to these misbehaving people. Anyone who touches you touches the apple of his eye. And um, God says, I, I will discipline those whom I love. That's true, but they remain the apple of my eye. Those of you who can still remember um, maybe um, taking your children to the um, designated place for the application of appropriate discipline, did you have spots like that? We very de definitely did in our house. All such acts were performed in a certain spot. Um, did you hate your children while you disciplined them? Uh, were, were your children still the apple of your eye while you did it? Now, this was a private matter. You weren't spreading it all over the community. Did you want to embarrass your son while you did this? No, it's something that had to be done. And you loved him enough because he was the apple of your eye. You didn't want him to turn out bad. And you knew he needed discipline. And you knew you might be temporarily feared even hated a little bit, and that's sad. But you were willing to go through this because you really loved your son. And God says, that's the way I feel. Now, these, these nations that came uh, were instruments of mine and discipline. They didn't love you. They didn't understand my plan. Remember in Micah? They overdid it. Others even gloated. They all misunderstood. You are the apple of my eye. But it raises the question, what is the apple of the eye? How valuable is that? Well, what's your opinion, um, any ophthalmologists here who could tell us what is the apple of the eye? Do your versions all read that way? The apple of the eye? The pupil? Yours says pupil? What do others say? Pupil? Any others? It's much debated, uh, I found. The apple of the eye. Any others? This one that decides, uh, I'm not sure what it is, but they know the intention of the verse. They say, um, he who hurts you sticks his finger in God's eye. 
<laughs> that's the intent. You know, that's a very sensitive place. Do you have that version with you tonight, anybody? Oh, which one is it? It's in the Living Bible. Oh, could you read it out loud from back there? Oh, here comes the microphone. This, this is worth hearing. And um, you can see Dr. Taylor thinking this through. How am I going to translate this to make it clear? Now, read it. That's good. Uh, the Lord of glory has sent me against the nations that oppress you, for he has harmed you, sticks his finger in Jehovah's eye. Do that again. He who harms you. For he who harms you sticks his finger in Jehovah's eye. Isn't that something? He who harms you sticks his finger in Jehovah's eye. That's very dramatic. I think the message comes across perfectly well there. Yeah. Well, anyway, God's care comes through very clearly. In 4.6, we have the famous verse, not by might, now by power. What do you think of that on reflection? 4.6. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What's the difference there? How does the spirit work? Well, no one described his work more than Jesus, as recorded in John. That when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Also, the fruit of the spirit, love. Uh, love and truth, the truth spoken in love. This is particularly the work of the Holy Spirit. The still small voice. Uh, is this God saying some things are not accomplished by might or by power? How about winning the great controversy? Does God win because he has more power than the adversary? If that's all that needs to be displayed, how come it's taken thousands of years? Does the devil doubt God's power? No, the Bible says when he thinks of the one who hung the whole vast universe in space, it terrifies him. And he knows that he has but a short time. The conflict is not over who has the power. The conflict is over who's telling the truth. All God asks of us is love and trust. And you can't produce that by force. You can't even command it. You can only win that by demonstrating that the truth is with you and that you can be trusted and you are worthy of your children's love. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. All the most important things are accomplished that way. I mean, God could create a whole new universe as far as might and power are concerned, but he couldn't even win Judas, could he? He tried, he washed his dirty feet. Could God even hold his number one created being? The infinitely powerful one with all his might and power could not hold the loyalty of Lucifer, who lived in his very presence and was so honored. He lost him. Was that from lack of might or power? It's just you can't produce what God wants. Loyalty, love, trust, you can't do that. Only by the Spirit, and the Spirit can be turned down. But that isn't weakness on his part. It's just that what God wants the most can only be won by a demonstration of, of trustworthiness. And that's the work of the Spirit. I think it's most significant in this verse. It really speaks about God's method of accomplishing the most important things. And that, thing, I think, ties in with Jesus' coming. There was no show of might or power. Now, when he healed the sick and he multiplied the loaves and the fishes, they began to think, ah, now, now that's what we're looking for, some might and some power. And realizing they were following him for the wrong reason, he then spoke some words of truth and they all left him. Remember? So those few times when Jesus was being followed because of his demonstration of miracle-working power, uh, it worried him that they were following for the wrong reason. And he turned them away. Didn't drive them away. He just spoke the truth. Then he turned to the disciples and said, you don't want to go too, do you? And they said, no, you have the words of eternal life. You have the truth. We don't know how much else you have, but at least you have that. Because he didn't even have a place to live. But at least for what the Spirit does, they stayed with Christ. What do you think about that verse? Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit. The temptation is to want to use the shortcut of might and power. If God had used power, he'd have lost the great controversy. You can't win that way. They aren't the issues anyway. As I read that text this week as I was studying it, yeah. I thought, 
Could God be saying to us, if you really want to know me, go beyond the might, go beyond the power. You'll never learn the kind of person I really am if you always remain at Sinai, if you're always looking for miracles, if you always want somebody to hit you hard with it with a switch to get you to do what's right. I think he's saying, this isn't the way we get to be friends. If you always look at my might, and if you always look at my power, we'll never become friends. You need to know me by my spirit, by the kind of person I am. That's the way we become friends, and you become my people. Yeah, don't you like that? I think the universe watched, you know, when God showed his might and power by drowning all but eight in a flood. How many were won by that? They built the Tower of Babel to escape this fearsome deity afterwards, you see. Of course, he had friends, to be sure. Um, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, how does that win? Sinai, how many were won by that? What were they doing when the might and power faded away? They were dancing around the golden calf. And the universe was seeing, not by might nor by power, but by truth spoken in love, I win some friends. And it's beautiful that Moses was standing there, not misunderstanding the might and the power, but saying there's no need to be afraid. Because he was a friend to whom God could talk face to face, as with a friend. So this is a whole theme, by the way, of our conversations about God on Friday night. It's a tremendous theme, it seems to me. And that's the thing we Adventists have to present on the basis of all 66 books. That this is the way the Infinite One wishes to be perceived. It doesn't win everyone's respect, but others of us say that is absolutely magnificent. You mean we live in that kind of a universe, presided over by that kind of a God? who does not like to raise his voice and show his might and power, that's incredible. Oh, he has might and power, to be sure, and apparently someday we will be able to see him in his might and power and yet not be scared. That'll take some doing, won't it? Uh, but that's what he would like to accomplish, and so Jesus came in human form, and no one was afraid of him. And before he left, he said, Do you know who I am? Not many recognized. But finally, you remember Thomas said, my Lord and my God, and he knew. And the stunning thing was they'd been talking to God for three and a half years with no one in between. What does that say to us? Does there need to be anybody in between us and our God? Well, we come to intercession a little bit, don't we, in Zechariah? So let's wait for that a moment. Look at some other spots, though. How about 9-9, nine, nine, a famous prediction? 9-9, nine, nine. Re rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem, lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, to be sure, but humble, and riding on an ass, on a coat, the fold of an ass. Remember the words I read a while ago, God says, I'm humble-minded, uh, the infinite God is humble. This is incredible, isn't it? And he comes riding on a, on a, on a donkey. Um, another place, 14.4, uh, that we uh, Adventists regard as a dramatic verse. When Christ comes, on that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two, from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the Mount shall withdraw northward, and the other half southward. And so on. We've used that, haven't we, in our eschatology, our understanding of closing events. Another place that must have meant a very great deal to Jews and all others who value the family very highly, 8 verse 4. Look at this picture. We don't use this so much as the ones in Isaiah about the little child shall lead them, you know, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. This one ought to be put right in with those. Thus says the Lord of hosts, when everything's been restored, old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with staff in hand for very age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. That's a wonderful picture. You might say, wait a minute now, you mean there'll be elderly people there who still need to hold themselves up this, <laughs> with, with sticks and canes? And, and you mean there'll be children there who haven't grown up yet? Well, I thought we got past that in Isaiah, where twice he says the lions will eat straw like an ox, and once he says there won't be any lions there. What he means is there'll be no ravenous beasts there, it will be perfectly safe. 
to a Jew, has not the family remained uh, the important unit in Judaism? And there are other countries uh, in the Orient, you know, where the family is everything. And grandma and grandpa, they stay by. And that whole unit is the, uh, the foundation of society. For it to be safe for grandma and grandpa to sit there and watch the children playing safely in the streets. I mean, that's utopia. That's heaven on earth, you see. Isn't that a picture one would like? It also says every man will sit under his own vine and his own fig tree. And they loved that. Maybe you'd rather have something else. A different tree? Do you want to play on a harp? Maybe you'd rather play an oboe or something? These are pictures that meant a great deal to them. I have never much cared for figs. I'd much rather be under a peach tree, you know, or an orange tree. Or, and I hope there'll be bananas there. Surely that, that, um, uh, that marvel of engineering, <laughs> uh, the, I mean, that is the, the most perfect fruit to take on a trip, isn't it? In the car, it all comes in its wrapping. When you peel it, it doesn't shatter and fall in your lap. It comes down just far enough. I mean, that took a genius to develop the banana. <laughs> I hope they'll be there. I'd like to be under, under a banana a tree. So the thing is, dream up anything you like that's good, and it'll be that and better still. That's all this is saying, and it's, it's magnificent. Also, look at 823, and this seems incredible. 8.23, thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days ten men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of a Jew, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Has that happened yet? Look at all the troubles they've suffered through the centuries. Who has ever said, we'd like to be with you, for God is with you? What's the last time representatives of the nations all around came to Jerusalem and said, it's evident God is with you, and we'll make treaties with you. Do you remember? Solomon, that's true, isn't it? That's why all the girls came with the treaties. The nations were saying, can we go with you? God is obviously with you. You are prospering so. And I don't think they've had occasion to say that from that day to this, have they? The Jew in this last one is the Jew that Jesus is talking about. An Israelite without guile. An yeah. Israelite indeed. Yeah. So if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to yeah. the promise. And this is one of the promises. Yeah, if you see the, um, the, those who accept the promise to Abraham as the real Jew. Paul talks about that in Romans, doesn't he? By the way, if we could remember all these things and not forget any of them for when we come to the New Testament books. The New Testament is built squarely on the Old. Paul got his whole theology from the Old Testament, coupled with what was beginning to uh, be reported about the life and teachings of Jesus. He had no gospel to read. His only documents were these that we're reading. What documents did Jesus have to find out who he was? But the same ones, you see. So uh, I hope we can remember those. It's interesting, you can't eat the banana from the tree. It has to be taken off, it has to be aged and ripened, and uh, you have to take the skin off, it has to serve its purpose that God planned for it. And the olive too, that was so abundant there, they don't uh, taste too good right off the tree, do they? Now, why would God be so reassuring if he knew they would later fail? Look at 6.15, those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall come to pass if, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. That uh, is all through scripture, isn't it? The promises and the threatenings of God are alike conditional. So the later history is a history of what might have been. Uh, all these predictions, this is what might have happened, and it didn't. You note the influence of leaders all through the books in the Old Testament. In 10, 2, and 3. 10, 2. Of course, each time we're plucking something right out of a whole context. For the teraphim utter nonsense, and the diviners see lies. The dreamers tell false dreams, and give empty consolation. Therefore, the people wander like sheep. They are afflicted for want of a shepherd. Good leadership. My anger is hot against the shepherds, and I will punish the leaders, for the Lord of hosts cares for his flock. 
the house of Judah, and will make them like his proud steed in battle, and so on. But the leaders, a day of reckoning for them, those who've led the people astray. Now, I think the most impressive thing is Zechariah 3, the picture of Satan accusing Joshua the high priest and through him the people. Because we don't have many pictures of this in the Bible. We do have several. This is one of them. Look at Zechariah 3, 1. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. And we have to wonder, who is this angel? And Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Who is the accuser of the brethren who accuses them day and night before God? See, that's not first mentioned in Revelation. It's mentioned here in Zechariah, in the Old Testament. Revelation 12.10, the whole chapter on the war up in heaven. The most vivid picture of the great controversy anywhere in the Bible. They're in Revelation 12, but it's mentioned way back here, this particular time. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, and as we fit in the details, we can tell this is Christ who is often called an angel, Michael, the archangel. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with rich apparel, and so on. That's the basis for Ellen White's magnificent chapter in Prophets and Kings, uh, entitled uh, Joshua the High Priest. Some say that she never really described the investigative judgment as it was called in her day. That's true, the Bible doesn't have that term. But this idea that the family meets to discuss the candidates for the kingdom and Satan is allowed to appear and accuse them. That whole chapter describes this. And it's very dramatic. She speaks of Satan arising and rehearsing and recounting all the sins he's tempted us to commit. He knows them all. And what, what chance do we have after he's made such a presentation? There are two places where she does this. In Prophets and Kings and in Great Controversy, a chapter entitled The Investigative Judgment. I don't know how anyone could say she didn't describe this thing in considerable detail, but it doesn't sound like what many people expect. It doesn't sound like a, a legal, uh, judicial court scene such as ours, but rather, for the last time, the family of the universe is convened to talk about the affairs of the family. God has done that many times before. Did he not do it in Job? And was not Satan there to accuse? Now, who accused and who defended? And of course, by accusing Job, Satan also accused God, and that's the way it is. And so, this last meeting of the family, that shouldn't surprise us that God would do this. He doesn't conduct the affairs of the universe behind closed doors, in smoke-filled rooms. Everything is public. And so he allows the adversary, who can no longer accuse God, this side of the cross, the universe will listen to no more of that. They're absolutely satisfied. But when the devil ventures to accuse you and me, even our guardian angels have to admit he might have a case. In fact, I imagine the devil there recounting our sins. Don't you wish you hadn't given him so much ammunition through the years? Isn't it folly to send him up some more tomorrow so we can make a better case? In order to turn the angels against God, the devil had to lie. In order to turn our future neighbors and friends against us, all he has to do is tell the truth. That's too bad we've given him that opportunity. And so you see him there recounting all these sins. If you were there hearing your own life described in detail, and if then your case should be put to a vote, would you have the nerve to vote for yourself? And say, in spite of all that, I'm, I'm really a good candidate for the kingdom. Vote for me. You couldn't, could you? You'd bow your head and say, what chance do I have? He hasn't even lied once. I did all those things that he's described. What happens? Well, in these two chapters, Ellen White describes Christ arising in his human form. 
His human form reminding the whole family looking on of everything that he's done to answer their questions, to make it perfectly safe, to admit former sinners to the kingdom if they only change and become willing to listen like the thief on the cross. They understand all of that. And Christ does not excuse our sins, she says. It's very dramatic. It goes on for pages in her writings. But, um, in fact, I have imagined Jesus saying, everything the devil has said about Brother Jones is true. In fact, who preserves the record according to Daniel 7? The court sits in judgment and the books are open. God preserves the record. I mean, God is not trying to get us in by hiding the evidence or erasing the tape. You know, there's no Watergate in order to get us in. We get in in spite of it all being there. And Christ could say, as a matter of fact, the devil could have said even more than he's chosen to say, but it looks so bad, even he has said, I rest my case. How much more evidence do you need that Brother Jones is not safe to say? And our guardian angel could say, well, if you need more information, just ask me. They know all about it. Now what chance do we have? What would our guardian angels need to hear in order to be willing to ne live next door to us? without locking the place up carefully after they leave for a stroll in the afternoon. I mean, what would have to be heard? Would it be that Jesus would stand there and say, this, this crook, Jones, who has been so uh, aptly described and truthfully delineated here in our presence by the adversary of us all, he's still a crook, but I've forgiven him. Is that what you'd want to hear? I wouldn't want to know whether he'd been forgiven. I'd want to know if he had a new heart and a right spirit and would be safe to live next door to. And that's why Jesus didn't say to Nicodemus, unless you be forgiven, you won't be saved. He said, unless you be born again of the spirit of love and truth and have a new heart and a right spirit, as in the 51st Psalm, unless you're willing to walk humbly before your God, Micah 6 and Hosea 6 and all his other places that run all through Scripture, you will not be in the kingdom. So all our future neighbors and friends want to hear is Christ's diagnosis of our innermost condition. Is the thief on the cross safe to have around? Is he safe to save? You see, only a legalist worries about the record. And unfortunately, we've been legalistic in disposing of the record. The record is never disposed of, it's history. And it'll always be there. How about poor David? His sins have all been immortalized on the pages of Scripture, and we even preach about them in the pulpit, the poor man. These things are not hidden, they're all public. Now, how could we possibly be safe to save in spite of the record, and how could we possibly be comfortable there with our guardian angel remembering everything? How could we be comfortable with God who remembers everything? And that's why a week from Friday we want to deal with that in our conversations about God. We have no need to fear God's infinite memory, for how did he treat the worst of sinners when he was here? Even ones he knew would never be saved, did he not wash Judas' feet? Did he not cover for him at the Lord's Supper? Did he tell the others what he was going to do? They thought he was going out to make a contribution to feed the poor. Isn't that incredible? That's how Jesus covered for his enemy who betrayed him and all the other evidences that we don't need to worry that God can remember. How about, though, our neighbors and friends? Will it worry you your guardian angel can remember? Or will he be like God in this respect? And how about us? Is that why Romans 1 says there'll be no gossips there? Interestingly, the sin of gossiping is one of the worst in that list in Romans. Because wouldn't a gossip have a field day up there for the first million years or two? And wouldn't he love to bother people going up to Rahab and say, Hey, tell me about your former profession, and so on. God will not allow anybody in who'd make anybody uncomfortable, because he's not going to make anybody uncomfortable, even though he remembers. And We discussed this, didn't we, with David and meeting Uriah and so on in the past. We have no need to worry about this. Once the Lord says, and only God can read the heart. Wouldn't that be true? Can angels read the innermost recesses of the heart? That's where God does have to give his diagnosis. He says, in spite of the record, the thief on the cross is a new man. I commend him as a disciple, as a pupil who's willing to listen and accept correction. He will be safe to have around. 
And if he can't say of that of us, we won't be there. Now that's what's going on now. It's not a whole business of moving sins around and adjusting legal standings and all that kind of thing. That's been a caricature of the investigative judgment. And it's why, as you may know, many people, even close to us, make fun of the investigative judgment and even deny it now. What they're denying, I don't believe in either. There is another picture of the investigative judgment. God gathering the family to discuss matters like this, of course he does that. And it makes sense and it's not legalistic. And Jesus dying on the cross didn't take care of this. It only provided a basis by which this discussion could take place in the end. So many folk today who talk of righteousness by faith are talking legalism. But if you talk about what really went wrong in the universe, in the family, a breakdown of trust and love and trustworthiness, and God proposes to win as many as possible back, and the question in the end is, has the thief on the cross been won back? Would he be safe to live next door to? The devil made charges against Job, and God dealt with that. And God even gave Job an opportunity then, because it wasn't the end yet, to demonstrate that he was a trusting and trustworthy friend. That's God's way. And when Job came through so wonderfully, God with pride turned to the family and said, any more questions about Job? And so in the end, he can say, any more questions about the thief on the cross? And Brother Smith and Sister Jones, you know, this is a very important time. It's happened before, and it's happening now. And it would seem to me that would concern us to be sure we would be people. We all have bad records. But people who know there is sincerity and integrity and humility in the heart. So Christ could say, never mind the record. This is a new person who would be safe to admit to the hereafter. You can see how cheats are out. Isn't that what Malachi says? Cursed be the cheat. You, you can't recommend a cheat. Whether he's forgiven or not, a cheat is not safe to have around. So we need to add Malachi to this as well. Now, what about intercession taking place here? Do we need someone between us and God? Never. When God was here for three and a half years, was there anyone between the disciples and God? Between Judas and God? Do we need anybody between us and the powerful adversary? Do we need someone to speak in our behalf and hold him off and so on? That's where Christ comes between. It's sad that we have placed someone between us and God. Though God is very gracious and says, if you're so scared of me, you need to think of a friend between. That's all right with me. And so children think of Jesus as the friend between them and the awesome one. You think God is jealous of his son, the children love the son more than the father? No, he's willing to wait. That, that's an emergency measure, this idea of someone in between. Remember in Exodus we talked about that? When the people were so scared, they said, Moses, you be in between. Please, you, get, you talk to God. You're his friend, remember? And then you talk to us. They begged for someone in between. God wanted to speak to them. In fact, in the verse in Exodus, the people say, well, God has been talking to us and we weren't destroyed, but we don't want to run that risk again. Moses, from here on, you be in between. And Moses was busy, so they set up a whole priesthood to be between. Were the priests human? Who was between those human priests and God? You see, there's never been a need for someone to be between us and God, as far as God's concerned. But those of us who are scared of God, God has kindly provided someone in between. But who's the one who came to bridge the gap? But God. If you believe Jesus is God, now all Jehovah's Witness friends have a problem. They do not believe that Christ Jesus is. So all these matters of intercession are helped here by Zechariah 3. By the way, a key text, since we won't meet again until the fall, that uh, touches on this is Christ's own words. We've referred to them in John 16, 26. There is no need for me to intercede with the Father for you, for the Father loves you himself. John 16, 26. Your version may have, there's no need for me to pray the Father, plead with the Father. Goodspeed says intercede with the Father because the Father loves you himself. Besides, who am I? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Who's pleading with me? So I hope we never leave the impression with people that the Father is not as loving and approachable and humble-minded as the Son. That's just incredible news. Not many believe that. But I think we need to remember that while our sins are important, yeah. 
And while our sin, the, that gives Satan a grounds upon which he can accuse us, yeah. I think more importantly um, is the fact that are we really, do we really know God? Yes, sir. And I think that's a question that the angels will ask and have a right to ask. Do they really know you? Are they really your friends? That's what it means. Are, Are you friends? able to talk to them? Yeah. Do they listen? And I think mm -hmm. that's even more important than the fact that two weeks ago, last Thursday, I did something yeah. I shouldn't have done. It's, mm -hmm. are, they, are they teachable? Mm -hmm. Can you reach them? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the important thing that need, needs to, to be decided, not only there, but within our own selves. I think with children, the most important thing we can teach them is to remain teachable. Be willing to listen. Be willing to do what God asks you to do. Be, and learn to be his friend because that's, mm -hmm. that's the crux of the whole matter, I think. Absolutely. Oh, that's very well said. I think that's, that's perfect. Let's look quickly at Malachi because it ties in with this and then, then we'll go back and summarize. In this short book at the end, do you find people who are willing to listen? Who know God at all well and are his friends? Are they not complaining at God's uh, treatment and God's behavior? Just run down through quickly. Chapter 1, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how hast thou loved us? Isn't that something? Saying to God, oh, I don't, we don't see that. How hast thou loved us? And then I look down to verse 6. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts, to you, O priests, who despise my name. And you say, how can you say that? How have we despised thy name? And God says, by offering polluted food upon my altar. And you say, how have we polluted it? How could you say that? And then dropping on down, let's say, to 13. What a weariness this is, you say. And you sniff at me, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering? Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat. It's not I hate the cheat, it's that I can't help the cheat. I mean, cheats are going to be lost. Can cheating patients be healed? I mean, you don't tell the truth to your physician. What can he do to help you? So this isn't um, that uh, God doesn't love them. He just can't help cheat. Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. Then going to 2.13. And this again you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor at your hand. And you ask, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness to the covenant between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Has not the one God made and sustained for us the spirit of life? And what does he desire? Godly offspring. That's an interesting passage to think about. So take heed to yourselves and let none be faithless to the wife of his youth, for I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. The one who gave divorce laws... And they said, good, God approves divorce, so they brought it to Jesus. And he said, no, I still hate divorce. I hated it when I gave you the permission to give your wives a writ of divorcement, but I gave it to you because you were so hard to teach. The hardness, stiffness of your necks and the hardness of your hearts. The Good News Bible translates that, you were so hard to teach. And covering one's garments with violence I hate, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to yourselves and do not be faithless and untrustworthy. But uh, he's not through yet. Look at 3.7. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Now these are the saints that came home, you know, getting ready for the Lord to come. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? We never left. You know, we are your chosen people. Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how are we robbing thee? How can you say this about us? In your tithes and offerings. And then the passage that follows on the tithe is one of the best read passages, isn't it? In the Adventist church, when we have stewardship, Sabbath, and other times. We're all familiar with that. Then look at uh, 3.13. 
Your words have been stout against me, says the Lord. They don't know him. They're not friends, you see. Their words have been stout against the Lord. Yet you say, how have we spoken against thee? You have said the following. That's how you have misrepresented me. You've said it is vain to serve God. It isn't worth it. What is the good of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? Henceforth we deem the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but when they put God to the test, they escape. Were well, they representing God very well? Very rude words, but there were the faithful friends, as always, in 316. While there were these rude people who did not revere God, were not his friends, there were these, 316. Then those who revered the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord heeded and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him. Of those who revered the Lord and thought on his name, they thought about him. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, my special possession. What do you have in your version for special possession? My very own? My jewels? My special possession? My special treasure. Um, sometimes this word special possession turns up in the, the older versions, my peculiar people. And as a boy, I thought that's one of the onuses we had to carry. We were a peculiar people. We did things differently, and I was so relieved to find the meaning of the word peculiar. Peculiar means something uh, you know, that is peculiarly yours. We use it that way, don't we? Belongs to one person. It's something you put a fence around, something you've, you've made around, and everything inside is mine. And God says, you are my special possession. That's peculiar people, not odd people, but people the Lord values very highly. Oh, I was so relieved to get rid of that. That uh, odd meaning of peculiar. You all knew that before. <laughs> when I acted, I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Thou, I do discipline those whom I love, but I don't want to destroy them. Then once more you shall distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. And then, of course, the familiar ending. For behold, the day comes burning like an oven when all the arrogant... Love is not arrogant, 1 Corinthians 13. All the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. Just like the book of Revelation ends with the third angel's message. Fire and brimstone, the Old Testament does too. So that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Does that sound like eternal burning? Or there's nothing left? So we've used that correctly, I think, through the years. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go forth leaping like calves from the stall. Now, King James, well, you'll grow up like calves in the stall, and you can see yourself getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The, <laughs> the Hebrew is rather, you'll be in such a marvelous vigor and health, you'll leap forth like calves from the stall, you see. Do you have that in the versions in front of you more? You'll leap forth like calves from the stall. Well, can you see Adam and Eve when the pearly gates are opened and they're welcome to Eden restored? Won't they want to run through and see how everything is? And you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes. I thought they'd be burning. No, they'll be ashes. Under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and ordinances that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. We talk about it as the law of Moses, don't we? It's not. It's God's law. He gave it through Moses, but it's God's law. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He's always sent a special messenger before a time of great crisis, hasn't he? And that's why we sometimes, in all humility, think that's our role too at, at the end. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. And so we come to the end of the... Old Testament, but we don't come to the birth of Christ yet. That's four centuries away. And during those 400 years, they became not less religious, but more and more religious, more disciplined, more preoccupied with pleasing God and doing the things that would guarantee their being saved. But they were doing it in the wrong way because they didn't know him. You see, when you worship the wrong God, then you serve him in ways that are appropriate to serving that kind of a God. 
Ellen White's comment is memorable. Wanting the spirit and grace of God, they tried to make up for the lack by a rigorous observance of religious ceremonies and rites. Thus, Satan succeeded in preparing the hearts of the people to reject the Savior when he should appear. Were they friends of God when the Son appeared? He said, if you had known my Father, you would have recognized me. And they didn't know him. But there were the few, of course. There were some that did, and some, it, it, it took some difficulty to persuade some of them with Saul that took a two-by-four on the Damascus Road. He had to go back to Sinai briefly, and then he listened to the still small voice who reasoned with him, and he gave in. Because the picture Paul accepted on the Damascus Road was not something different from the Old Testament. It was the correct meaning of the Old Testament, wasn't it? Wouldn't you say a humble, gentle God is presented in the Old Testament? No question about it. And Jesus matched that perfectly. But they had used the same Old Testament we've read to develop an entirely different picture of God. And so they didn't recognize the Son. They even hated him. And to this day, some still wait for the Messiah to come. Well, a big question here. Um, God brings them back. And he knows that in a few hundred years, they'll turn down his Son. Um, why do you think he waited that long? Why not then send the son earlier? Why not send him during the days of Hosea and Isaiah when there was great wickedness? I mean, there'd have been enough people around to reject him and crucify him. Why didn't he send him then? Why didn't he send the son before the flood when every man's thought was evil? They would have turned him down. Why did he wait all this long time is there any difference about conditions in the world or conditions among his people when Jesus came than at any time before? Has there not always been wickedness? Plenty of it all along. Was he waiting for the world to become more wicked? Could it get any more wicked than the flood? So what was he waiting for, in your opinion? Because then we ask the question, what's he waiting for now, at the present time? Is he waiting for the world to get sufficiently wicked? Oh, he's restraining it so it won't get too wicked too soon because the saints would be overwhelmed. So he's holding that back. Well, what's he waiting for the saints to do? Well, but going back rather to the time of Christ, what was different for the first time, thanks to Ezra and Nehemiah, and the discipline of Babylonian captivity helped a bit. And remembering all the testimony of the prophets through the years. Isn't it that for the first time in history, God has a group of people who are not worshipping idols. And they're very careful about their association with the heathen. And they absolutely accept the 39 books of the Old Testament as the word of God. And they believe in creation. And creation week and the seventh-day Sabbath, and look how they observed it. They believed and obeyed all ten of the Ten Commandments. And then the whole sacrificial system that God gave to represent the plan of salvation in an emergency way until Christ would come. Did they follow that scrupulously? How about all the laws of health and hygiene? How about rules of contamination and so forth? Why, when Jesus came, he said, I notice you even strain gnats out of your goat's milk when they fall in. That's how careful you are. And when you pay tithe, I mean, these were the kind of people you really want in your church. You know, people you can count on week by week to pay a faithful tithe. Even tithe their seeds, the, the seeds of mint, anise, and cumin. Nine for me and one for the Lord. How careful they were. And Christ came. And he wasn't turned down by irreligious people. He wasn't turned, he wasn't turned by the, down by the people in Hosea's day who went up into the mountains to sacrifice with the cult prostitutes. He came to people who would never do such a thing. They were the most pious, blueprinting, Bible-quoting, Sabbath-keeping, tithe-paying Adventists the world has ever known. They're the ones he came to. And they didn't recognize him. They rejected his message. They finally said he had a devil to be so describing God. And they finally tortured him to death to silence him. And having nailed him to the cross to prove they were still God's chosen people, they went home to keep the seventh-day Sabbath 
and celebrate the Passover. Now, does that say anything to the universe? Does that say anything of consequence as to the value of going through the Bible to be sure we know what God is really like? It isn't enough to read the 39 and say, now I know what God is like. You can read the 39 and come up with the devil's picture of God. They did it. Have we read it aright? Have we come up with the right picture of God? As we've described God to each other, does it match the God that Jesus revealed? A God who'd rather talk softly they didn't revere that kind of a God, most of them. They were waiting for the God of Sinai to lead them against their enemies. That's what they wanted. When you set up your kingdom, said James and John and their mother, can we be beside you as your vice presidents? That's what they were looking for. And when he allowed himself to be carried away, to be crucified, the disciples all left him but John, absolutely discouraged and dismayed. After all, he was not the one who was going to set up the kingdom as they anticipated it. I think that the picture that Jesus revealed is represented all through these 39 books, magnificently so, if we take them as a whole, and hopefully we've not led each other astray in this. I think the way we've described God in the Old Testament fits precisely what Jesus said and did when he came. So when we talk about the Father or the Son, do we need to really make any distinction when it comes to character and the way they love people, the way they treat them? That hasn't been so, has it, as we've gone along. It wouldn't matter which God spoke on Sinai. The son could raise his voice if need be, and the father could talk softly and would prefer to do so. It makes no difference whatever. Because even God says, not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit, that is, by the truth spoken in love. That's the way we three like to do things. And if you like to do things that way, you'll love the kingdom. Blessed are the meek, for the kingdom is theirs. And I really can't save other people, because if I let in some people who are not meek, I'd have to thunder on Sinai from time to time, send Shebrahs into the camp, and I'm never going to do that again. When the emergency is over, all who are meek and willing to listen will be saved. Does that mean after all we found our God is weak? No, he did speak one day and hang the whole vast universe in space. That's true. And in emergency, he has thundered and shaken the ground beneath our feet, and he could do it again, but he never wants to do it that way again. Ah, this is magnificent in our God. And that's why after one trip through all 66, a group of us got together many years ago and decided we'd write down our picture of God. We'd never seen one. Formally adopted, even in the Dallas statement of our beliefs, there's no description of God. Someday we'll have that in there, Mary. <laughs> that's one way we could even improve on that statement. We wrote down something like this. We believe on the authority of all 66 books that God is an infinitely powerful but equally gracious person who values nothing higher than the freedom and the dignity and the individuality of his intelligent creatures, that their love, their trust, their worship, their willingness to listen and obey may be freely given. Of course, we've learned as we've read so far, and there's more to come. There can be no freedom without order and self-discipline and mutual love, and trust, and respect. When those are absent, we have an emergency, calling for emergency measures. I mean, what freedom would there be if we should find that we worship a capricious, untrustworthy God? Don't we count on him, a God of order, and trustworthiness, and discipline? Someone you could count on for eternity. There's no freedom without that. It also follows that if we choose to be disorderly, unloving, untrusting, and untrustworthy, we will begin to reap undesirable consequences both in this life and most disastrously in the end, but not in the hands of our gracious God. His cry over the disorderly as they perish will be, why will you die? How can I give you up? How can I let you go? Is that a weak way to run the universe? Not if you only admit the meek. Because they respect this. Some people looked at Christ and were overwhelmed with reverence and respect. And they worshipped him as God. 
Most people, looking at him, so gentle and so meek, were not so moved. So somehow we have to convey that message. And if Jesus hadn't come in human form to convince us by demonstration that it's true, how could we believe it? That the one who thundered on Sinai would much rather speak softly at the mouth of the cave. The one who drowned all but eight enjoyed so much more saying, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. Uh, that's the kind of God he is. This is not weakness. That's self-control. You know, when you possess enough power, but don't use it destructively, that's much more admirable. God could lash out any time he wants and wipe out the opposition, but he doesn't do it. And when Jesus was here, he knew he had all divine power at his fingertips. And when he was tormented and abused and insulted and rejected by the people he came to save, he was tempted to use that divine power. He not only would have wiped out the opposition, but thousands would have followed him. And he longed for a few converts, but he'd have got them for the wrong reason. And so he quietly and humbly put up with all the abuse. And some despised him. And many said, he can't be God. He can't even be a saint, because God would rescue him if he were. And you remember in Desire of Ages, there was a stir among the angels. They wanted to come forward, and at least they would exercise their power and rescue their God. And God said, stand back and see the most incredible thing. And you know how Jesus behaved. No wonder when he went to heaven on Sunday and asked the heavenly family if it was enough they said, that's clear. How terrible you had to go through so much to convince us. Because, you know, one third of them left and the other two thirds had questions. Now they're absolutely convinced. And in the last book of the Bible that we'll end with next time, they cease not day and night saying, holy, holy, you're righteous and just and good. And what a price you paid to convince us, not with claims, but with the evidence of costly demonstration, painful demonstration. And that has secured the rest of the universe. And the only remaining question is, do we like it? Uh, does it really stir us that this is the kind of God we worship? And I hope our trip through the 39 uh, has enhanced our picture and uh, made us more willing to be friends. Because you can't force people to be friends. In the highest sense of freedom, some of us say, that is magnificent. We like that. It would be a privilege to live with that kind of a God for eternity, and we wouldn't even be afraid. But should we pray before we go? Our loving Father in heaven, how much we've enjoyed going through these 39 books, the books that Jesus grew up with, and Paul, who later saw the truth so clearly. Now in our time, we have not only the 39, but all 66, and all the confirming evidence of history, through the years and our own experience, and even thy messenger in these latter times, who's proved so biblical and so helpful. Surely thou hast a right to expect that we of all people should be thy knowledgeable friends, who could speak with pride of thee, and to do it well. And surely it is a great honor and a privilege in these last days, when there are so many competing and conflicting pictures of thee, Many pictures of thee that are not worthy of men's trust and admiration. Surely it is a great privilege to have the truth and to have all the evidence in support of it. What a shame that we should miss any opportunity or that when the chance comes to speak well and truly of thee, we do not do it skillfully and persuasively because we have not armed ourselves with all the information in the 66 books. So we do pray for thy blessing on our experience thus far. We know the greatest revelations yet to come in the Gospels, but we've read them before. We know the evidence, and so again tonight, we say to thee, we honor and revere thee with great awe and wonder as an infinitely powerful person. And yet we know there is no need to be afraid. We thank thee for the price thou hast been willing to pay to clear this up and confirm it with evidence that will stand for eternity. What a shame if we should mismanage this evidence or picture thee as another kind of a God. In these last days, 
we have the message that if a group of thy friends should arise and begin to present thee as thou really art, then the spirit of truth and love would give us persuasiveness and influence to spread this word, this good news, as it's never been spread by a group of human beings before. And the gospel will be heard by every nation under heaven, and the end can come. Forbid that we should miss the privilege and opportunity that this affords to us.